Hello, everyone. It's so nice to see your faces. I love that we all get to gather here at the Film Music House at Sundance. Great to be here. Hey, great to be with great you. Great to be here. Hi. So for everyone who's watching, obviously we have Nanita Desai, we have Nathan Halpern, and we have Will Bates. And we're going to have this amazing conversation about documentary filmmaking and scoring for documentary. And what I love about the three of you is that you might be the most prolific composers in this space that I've come across. Um, and so one of the first things that I wanted to ask you guys is what first kind of drew you to this space? What was it about documentaries specifically that made you say like, yes, this is what I want to kind of devote a lot of my time to? Will, maybe we'll ta start with you. Sure. Um, I guess, um, well, I mean, first of all, I've always wanted to be a composer. Um, since I was a little kid, I was obsessed with John Williams and all of those greats. And, uh, and I think part of being, I live in LA now, but part of, um, I grew up in London and then I moved to New York City and I lived there for 15 years. And I think part of being in the community of that city, it has such a vibrant documentary scene. And I found that a lot of the filmmakers that I met and a lot of people that were making Sundance movies and independent movies all seem to be um, at some point in their careers making documentaries. And, and just because of that, by virtue of that, I ended up um, jumping into it. And I, I, you know, I'm fortunate enough to continue to work with some of those filmmakers. And, and uh, documentaries are just, it's such a different skill set, I think, for a composer. And it's, it's a, a lovely challenge and keeps us all interested in the, in the work. Yeah, absolutely. And Nathan, you kind of almost exclusively really have, have worked in this space. What is it about, I mean, some of these documentaries that you've scored have been on really intense topics. So what was it about those projects that kind of like drew you in? Yeah, no, that's, uh, it's true that a lot of the films I've worked in, uh, both, both, you know, docs and even, and even some of the narratives uh, too are, are, have been, you know, quite intense and in, in affect uh, for, for sure. And I think, you know, for me, you know, my interest in film and my interest in music, you know, as a young person and as a teenager were both sort of happening in tandem. Mm -hmm. And I didn't put it together until a little bit later to do them both kind of together. You know, similarly, you know, Will, as you, as you mentioned, you know, being in New York City was a big part of that, you know, both playing in music, playing in bands and playing shows, but then being a part of that sort of film culture. And, you know, we have this, you know, tremendous, you know, sort of film repertory culture in New York City, and the two were always sort of informing the other, you know, and I found that to be, you know, a very, you know, significant and um, inspiring thing. Yeah, absolutely. And Nanita, one of the things that, about kind of this documentary space is that you have such a, uh, you've especially like uh, very recently, like with For Sama and even with the, the Reason I Jump, they're both such interesting stories, but I also think kind of being told in a different way. You know, this was not the first, for someone was not the first necessarily documentary to kind of cover the, the Syrian war, but it was a very unique perspective. The same, same thing with this idea of a unique perspective with the reason I jump. Can you kind of talk about what, what it was like working on projects? Did you immediately recognize that with, with the footage that you were seeing? No, not at all. It was a very, very unusual and different process. And I guess, you know, I've come from, I, I, I fell into documentary score writing and now I find it as much as I sort of branch off into other areas like video games and, and fiction and, and drama series and so on. I find that the core root of what I'm known for is obviously documentary scoring, but uh, I, I find that the way I, my path into a film is trying to find the true heart in terms of being totally uh, in having integrity and authenticity to the storytelling and and for Sala was meant to be a normal one hour documentary for channel four that we were editing for you know nine ten eleven weeks and we ended up offlining being in the edit for one and a half years and I scored it in three different ways so so authenticity was was paramount I brought in Syrian musicians and uh, musicians to play on it and with the reason I jump I think I worked on that for a year as well and I find this the storytelling and, and the heart and the power of real true life stories is so potent and powerful 
you know, the, what's that that phrase? Um, uh, fact is stranger than fiction, you know, yeah. And, uh, yeah. and and yeah, and and uh, and that's the beauty of documentary score writing is that you know there's so many there are differences and there are so many similarities between fiction and non-fiction but um but yeah i sort of gravitate towards more the more experimental side and the more immersive score process uh, side of, of writing for, for documentaries now yeah when you guys are thinking about taking on a new project a new documentary project what are some of the questions that you guys ask yourselves internally before deciding yes this is the project for me are there i mean again like you guys have taken on projects that explore you know um very complicated aspects of of the the human experience you know i, I think something like crazy not insane that you did will with this idea of really exploring the psychology of murderers like that's a very intense place to keep your keep your mind and keep yourself musically too and so i that kind of made me think like what goes through your mind when when you're approached with a project like that is it always the relationship with the filmmaker where you're like yes of course i want to work with you again or is it sometimes you know you have to take into account the story that you're going to be telling i think for me i, I always want there to be some sort of new Thing that excites me about about a new project. I, every project is different, even with even when you're working with the same. Obviously, I've done a lot of Alex's movies, and and every time you start a new one, I feel like there's always the same conversation. Like, what's the thing that's unique about this one? And sometimes for me, that will be an instrument. It'll be just some kind of weird way of recording. It might be. I, I feel like every every project for me always begins the same, even if it's a narrative or, or a documentary. I always have that moment behind the piano, even if it's not a piano score, where I'm, I have to have this sort of eureka moment thematically where I find the thing that connects to a character or a storyline that exists just for that, in that universe. And it, it, one thing wouldn't live without the other. And And I think until I've had that moment, then I can kind of move forward with the rest of the score. And sometimes, yeah, finding finding that is, is is like going to a music store to pick up a new instrument. I, Nathan probably knows this place. There's a place in um, in the West Village called the Music Inn. Do you know that guy? Yeah. Um, right. So my when I used, lived in New York, I would go to um, go to his store and be like, I did a show, for example, called The Looming Tower, also yeah. through yeah. Alex, and um, walked in there and be like, you know, there's a bunch of scenes in Kazakhstan. What have you got from there? And like he go into the back of the store and bring out some like random stuff and then take it home and half learn how to play it you know <laughs> yeah, exactly. but like that I feel like I've sort of built a career out of being able to pick up all sorts of silly instruments and try to make some melody out of them and that's that's the journey I think that we're always looking for some new sound right it's kind of yeah of course of course um, and Nathan, is there anything different for you about the process? Is there are there any you know other questions that you're kind of asking yourself before taking on a project? Well, I mean, I think that you know one of the sort of most wonderful blessings for us as you know composers and musicians in you know getting to work with you know with a wonderful film is inspiration, right? And that's something that you know you really can't put a price on and you know, if you're just, you know, if you're writing sort of music solo aside from picture, just sort of in general, that's always everything else aside, that's sort of, that's the core driving sort of kernel that's going to like make a piece of music come into existence and have life. So it's this incredible sort of creative blessing to be able to, you know, engage with something that speaks to you on some level and is going to bring some kind of new music out of you that might not have come forth um otherwise um and you know that's you know that's an incredibly um wonderful and an important thing that you know that's that's such a great thing to have certainly you know with you know with directors if there's people with whom you have like a nice relationship and you you know start to have a kind of feeling for their work and you have a kind of symmetry and way of going together then as sort of as you continue to do new projects um you know having that sort of development together and exploring new you know having on the one hand you have that continuum and then the the new ways in which a new project will evolve and change so you know the film i have at, at sundance this year with non-fu wang you know in the same breath I've, we've done several films together over the years yeah. and to me i feel like you know i've 
you know, have a good sense and have thought quite a lot about her sort of voice as a, as a filmmaker. And I see in this film, as with the other ones, both sort of a continuity and certain thematic connections, but also a tremendous development in the, and change in the filmmaking, in the subject matter, and then opportunities to, um, to help to kind of bring that out more with a different sort of musical approach than we may have used um, for previous projects. So, you know, that, that's, that inspiration is, uh, is such a huge and, and wonderful thing, I think, for all of us. Yeah, that's so interesting too, because essentially then you both get to grow together in her filmmaking process. This kind of, you get to go on the long journey with her, which I think is really interesting. I definitely want to dig into that um, more a little bit later. But um, before we move on kind of from this, you know, idea of, of jumping into documentary, um, I wanted to ask you guys, how does the creative process, because obviously both, all three of you have kind of worked in both um, fiction and nonfiction, um, and it, how does the creative process differ for you? And, and specifically, I kind of wanted to talk about timeline, because this is kind of like very foreign to me, because in the media, when, when a big documentary comes out, you typically read about how long it's taken the filmmaker to put this documentary together. And some of these filmmakers are dedicating, you know, uh, five, seven, 10 years of their life to a project. So I wanted to ask each of you, and obviously I know this must differ, you know, project to project, but just as, you know, uh, trends that you've noticed, how early do you get brought onto these projects? And how um, early in the filmmaking process do you kind of start to play around with what sounds you might explore? Um, and then how do you deal with kind of the, the long wait if there is one? Um. Yeah, I'll start this one off. Um, uh, I I found more and more so that filmmakers are asking composers or asking me at least to come in earlier on as as early on as possible, and I relish that because it you feel that you know I feel that I'm a filmmaker as well from a musical perspective. I'm helping to tell the story and helping to inform the edit. So for example, with The Reason I Jump, I wrote a lot of material. I, I really like to write a lot of material away from the images, away from the pictures and and experiment and uh, and, and more so on that film we were doing. So, I, I mean, I, I, I'm very visually inspired and I'm more so than anything else, but on that film and on other projects, I'm finding that I will write away from the images, give the edit a whole raft of ideas and experiments. And it's a little bit like throwing mud against the wall. Yes. Um, we'll experiment with, with um, uh, in, you know, instrumental palette and techniques. And, and then some of it may work, some of it may not work in the edit. But then you're, you're helping to for, inform the edit and, and vice versa. And, and that's a really cool way of working. But as opposed to, I mean, I scored American Murder last year uh, for Netflix and I got brought in just after the first lockdown in March. And I think I had eight weeks to score it and they wanted a live orchestral score. Wow. Uh, we had to record all the rem uh, musicians remotely. Uh, and some of the, these players were in their kitchens and we were uh, <laughs> had, and controlling, controlling the... Um, their computers remotely. I was in my studio, the engineer was in his studio and, and the musicians were in their kitchens or their living rooms. And it was, that was a tough challenge getting, uh, but Netflix were great because instead of having them all in one place recording in one day, they gave me an extra week to record so that we layered everything like a cake from Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, the cellos, the violas, the violins and so on. So that was fun. But but I also hold, uh, like on Reason I Jump, I hold experimental recording sessions with musicians coming to my studio over the span of you know several months and, um, and record a whole palette of sounds uh, where I create a custom library of phrases mm -hmm. and motifs that I, you know, that I'll work on with them and then use those recording session material elements as part of the writing process as well. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. And, and Nathan, have you ever had to deal with this moment where you maybe had like a, a long period of time between maybe getting the first parts of, of, of the footage and then, you know, much later getting that second batch? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there are some cases in which, you know, it's something happens and you're just brought on at the end and like, here's the movie, it's done and let's do it. And you blast through it very quickly. That's sort of one variation. I think to me, the ideal sort of really key parts are sort of like 
the very early part and the very end, you know, which is to say, you know, like as, as Nanita was, was discussing, when you have the opportunity to very early on write some pieces with just sort of a general sense of like the feel of the piece, not super locked to picture, get that in there, get that shared with the editors. And you so often find that when you do that, that may often become like a real part of your kind of motifs and backbones of the score. And then, you know, at the, at the same time, I think it's, it's important important for me, similarly to, you know, the, the ending part of the process is really crucial um, because, uh, you know, to me, especially, you know, for docs, making sure that you can still find a way to create a really rigorous, meaningful thematic structure yeah. to the music and to the way that it all sort of hangs together structurally, especially because in the case of so many docs, and this I think is maybe sometimes a more unique challenge, Unlike some narratives, their overall editorial and story and narrative structures and character relationships are often uh, unconventional. Yeah. You know, it's not going to immediately fit, you know, you might have a more sort of complex multi-protagonist narrative, or you might have a real disunity of location or big shifts. And so, you know, there's so many different ways that that can go. And, you know, to be able to still apply sort of classical sort of dramatic musical dramatic structure to the overall score to bring things together um, in some ways is even more crucial yeah. um, I think than in something that might have a more conventional structure because the film really needs you to help kind of you know unite these things sort of dramatically emotionally uh, and conceptually so I'd say both the beginning and the end part of the process I think are the real key sweet spots yeah absolutely that reminds me too or that that makes me wonder, it makes me a little bit curious, Will, uh, with The Looming Tower, I mean, this was a big project. You're talking like 10 part, you know, series. Uh, and, and you're also exploring, uh, you know, uh, so so The Looming Tower, you know, you're exploring that road leading up to 9-11, you're exploring, uh, you know, changes in power, you're exploring this, you know, tension between the FBI and the CIA. Uh, you're also exploring so many different areas in the world. Like, how did you take a project like that and find that kind of musical unity and that cohesiveness. I think that one was really about character. It was really yeah. like finding the stories and the, there's such a human story within all of that. Like this, the tragedy of the head of the FBI like dying in the, in the, in the towers and everything. And, you know, once he obviously left the bureau um, what's interesting about that project is that initially when I was brought on, they were gonna, it was going to be totally much more like a documentary. Mm. Um, and Alex was an EP on it and it, it was gonna have this sort of much more sort of uh, verite feel to it. And, I, and as the project developed, it became more of a narrative driven story, which was kind of interesting. So it, or it always had this kind of beating heart of a, of a documentary and, and it, it's in the script and in Lawrence's mm -hmm. book, it's very kind of, based on facts and I think that's what really is what really drew a lot of people to it yes. um it's such an emotional story for so many of us um it had to be kind of dealt with this sort of fact-based storytelling um so I think that that was really important with the music too and and kind of speaks to what Nathan was just saying like having to take a lot of those disparate locations and themes and sort of give it a, a coherency and I you know that's again that's just part of the fun of what we do and finding those colors and putting the circle into the square and like figuring out the puzzle and um and you know with a lot of documentaries another thing i just wanted to add to what he was saying is that um sometimes you, you don't know how the story's going to end i'm not sure if you guys have had this experience but they um a lot of times the you'll be editing and you know involved in the edit and your music hopefully will be kind of helping to kind of guide that process but quite often the the conclusion of the story may not be done until like two weeks before the screening at Sundance. You know, I remember like working on We Still Secrets, are we gonna get Julian? Are we gonna, you know, is yeah. it always like, is this gonna happen? Are they gonna get the interview with with Tom and Nicole for going clear? You know, it's all yeah. like you never, it was always this kind of exciting moment. And so right up until I feel like that's only the case with documentaries, that sometimes you can be in the final mix and they'll be like we need another cue because we just got more footage in you know it's like it can be pretty nuts in that way 
it's that's really interesting. And, and and I wanted to now that we're we're still um, going back to the Lumi Tower, and, and then I promise we'll we'll move on to some other of your projects. But you mentioned in an interview, and I thought this was very interesting, um, that you know there are there was this moment in in the Looming Tower um, throughout the process that you were saying that tragedy affects melody, and I wondered if you could really talk to that because I do think that a lot of younger composers, especially like. That, that's a big moment musically to understand how to approach that balance and, and kind of learn how to maybe shift musically when, when you are trying to balance uh, your, your, your themes and, and really that really trying to drive on that cohesiveness, but also being really delicate around the subject matter and what's happening in the story. Yeah, um, I, I've always felt that that's, it's such a light touch that is required with tragedy and it, otherwise it just you know it's the knife edge of melodrama and quite often you'll see that happening you know and, and it, it'll just be something something will be happening on screen and if the composer is kind of bashing you over the head with that emotion it it just clamps it down and destroys it so I've often felt that um you just have to let those moments really breathe um mm. and the other thing about I tragedy I don't know I mean this is obviously not really the panel for it but um when you score like something that's frightening and that does happen in, in documentaries too but like in a horror score I often feel that that's something that is far more terrifying like the 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 horrifying tragedy of, of, of you know like a violent scenario that's scored with something that's deeply sad is somehow more disturbing yeah. Um, and you know that's definitely something that you that can be applied to the documentary toolkit. I don't know. I again, music is such a powerful tool, and it, it has such a you wield a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of power with it, and you have to kind of do it with a, a light touch a lot of the time. I feel. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's really important. That idea of just letting something breathe, like you kind of know you have to you have to trust your instincts on that. I think. Um, so obviously we can't ignore the fact that we're sitting here at Sundance, um, and this is a very special Sundance with everything going virtually. Um, but I wanted to talk to each of you. You've had really tremendous uh, Sundance success, each of you separately. Um, and I wanted to kind of dig into some of those projects. And so Nanita, I thought we would start with you. Um, and I wanted to kind of explore um, maybe a, a little bit more deeply the, the project, The Reason I Jump. And again, I would love for you to kind of talk to, you know, uh, the approach that you took musically, but also there was a lot of, you know, uh, technological advancements that you guys were using and maybe using music in, a, in sound design in a new way, in a different way to help tell this story. Again, trying to keep in mind that it was such a unique perspective. So I was wondering if you could kind of talk us to through that process. Yeah, sure, Amanda. Um, so basically, The Reason I Jump is based on the book, The Reason I Jump, written by a 12-year-old Japanese boy who's non-speaking uh, autistic. And, and the book is actually made up of 53 questions uh, where he explains what it feels like to be autistic from his perspective. So the film is a sort of an adaptation where you've got five contributors um, who are autistic, non-speaking, non and interwoven with their contributions and their, their, their lives are these extracts, these beautiful poetic extracts and passages from the book that are very stylized. So it's a very multi-sensory experience and we mix the sound in um, Dolby Atmos in 360 sound. And I work very closely with the director and the editor in terms of um, trying to dive into the film musically. The where the where the sound design had to was a more abstract representation of of the writings in the book. The music represents the emotional state of being and gives the characters an internal voice. So we use various, we devise these concepts and, and parameters for ourselves. So instead of having themes for characters, we had themes for or sort of sound worlds for these concepts of autism and how people experience autism. So, for example, they're nonverbal. And I know it sounds like a cliche, but I wanted to give the characters a voice. Uh, and so we used a human voice. Mm -hmm. But I took extracts, um, these words from the original book, translated them back into the original Japanese, wow. and then 
wrote them, deconstructed them, and actually you hear singing of key phrases from the book in, in the music, like we are outside the flow of time or beautiful circle, you know, these key moments. So they're actually sung and we created these polyrhythms and, and, uh, and sort of verbal textures and layering. And then another aspect was um, oscillations and repetition. And because autistic people, these characters, uh, are very, very heightened in terms of their sense of sound and, and music, affects them incredibly deeply. And uh, they're very hypersensitive to, to the environment uh, in, a, in an amazing way that um, we took uh, found sound elements and integrated them into the music and vice, vice versa. So there are scenes like there's a ceiling fan that goes round and round. It's my homage to um, Walter Murch from <laughs> Apocalypse Now, <laughs> where he took the sounds of uh, ceiling fans and table fans and, and these circular motions, which autistic people find very cathartic. Mm. And I took those elements and created rhythms out of them and layered them so to create this sort of polyrhythmic feel and um and out of the sound design grows pieces of music um and and then back again so we were really blurring the lines with with music design and i wrote a lot of um, I, I brought in actually one one thing i want to say is um in terms of authenticity and integrity to the subject matter i brought in a cellist uh, with the who plays for the london philharmonic orchestra and she's autistic herself and oh. she's a cultural ambassador for the uh, National Autistic Association in the UK. And so she came to my studio and I'll give you an example. I played a scene to her and I had my back to her and she was playing the cello and uh, and I showed her a scene and I said, this is this scene is really key and important in the film. And it's about how uh, these scientific experiments were, that were done in the Second World War with autistic people and um, and everything went silent and I turned my I turned around and looked at her and she was crying and I thought oh wow. my god is the music is the music that bad you know <laughs> said, no 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 she said I feel it so deeply you know I experience everything that these characters experience on screen I go through it every day of my life and to have that kind of perceptiveness and sensitivity was made all the more poignant and and beautiful with her contribution to to the music and it was the same with for summer i brought in a syrian violinist who's a refugee and uh, who lives in italy now and he created this sound on his violin that was really raw and gritty and dirty and it represented the the aching heartbeat of Aleppo. So, so you know, finding the right choice of musician is really important to me as well. Yeah, um, that, that's super powerful. And and well, moving on to you know, in gosh, it was what 2019 that you brought Hillary to Sundance, right? Right. And what I find so interesting about this documentary, I loved this documentary. Um, you know, obviously she's a very polarizing you know subject matter. Um, and what I loved, so this is the tagline of the of the film, or at least the one that they were really pushing at Sundance, was this idea of like everyone has an opinion on Hillary Clinton. And what I loved about the documentary, and really too, I thought you supported the music in this way of like you didn't want to lead the audience too early, you didn't want to lead them, you know, too much. Of you wanted to kind of protect that space of everyone's allowed to have an opinion about Hillary Clinton. And so I wanted to, to talk about that process. How early did you come on to the project? Um, how much did you know about her personal life? Like, what was it like kind of stepping into the world of Hillary Clinton? Um, that one, they were they were not quite locked. They had some temp in there. Um, yeah. And they got in touch because some of the temp was me, I think. So that's always, <laughs> a, I don't know, it's kind of a nice-ish place to start. <laughs> exactly. um, but yeah, I, as as I was writing, they were kind of adapting the edit. Um, and you know, as a as a Brit, I I didn't. I feel like we didn't really know about her until she became the first lady. So I was learning so much, especially in that first episode, the one you're talking about. There's just so much background to her. She's she's you know the whole thing of her being like on the in the Nixon impeachment trial. You know that she was yeah. she was a prosecutor there and it's like it's insane so it was lovely to for me to learn about her and I feel like that's kind of that was part of my process in a way I was like 
I felt like the audience. I was kind of being educated in in Hillary's extraordinary life. And I found with that one, it was, you know, the, the whole show is about kind of going backwards and forwards between her early life and her and her current life and her sort of concept of, or the, the people's concept of her later in life. So I found myself kind of writing these quite intricate, innocent melodies for her earlier life and then basically taking a sledgehammer to them for yeah. later, kind of granulizing and just like having a fragment of that theme and then having it later. It was kind of a really useful tool to be able to kind of build on different, the different palette for her later in life. Um, but yeah, that was a that was really a, an amazing project to be on. And then you know, obviously, we're we're here, and this is actually a very special project, Nathan, that you are bringing to Sundance, and people can actually watch it um, this year. And so, I want you to kind of talk about in the same breath, and I would love to kind of explore again, going back to what we talked about earlier in the conversation, your kind of longstanding relationship with Nanfu, and really. Um, I, Obviously, this this project is is very interesting because it is kind of her continuation as a filmmaker, but also very special to this year because it does touch on on the pandemic. And um, so, so I wanted to kind of hear. Um, obviously, it had to have been kind of strange to to score during the pandemic. Sounds like a, a lot of you had projects during that time, but um, also, what was so special about this project for you? Well, of course, it's been uh, incredibly wonderful to be writing music during the during the pandemic and in this period of time and has been a very cathartic for sort of all the films that I've worked on during this time, as I'm sure it's been uh, for all of us. So I mean, we've been very fortunate in that way. I mean, one one thing that's that's sort of interesting when I think about sort of the the trajectory of the of the works that I've worked on, you know, with with Nanfu is that um, and this kind of speaks to some of the things we've been talking about, um, you know, her earlier films, um, particularly her first film, Hooligan Sparrow, which I, um, which was at Sundance, you know, her first film, which was at Sundance a, a few years ago, you know, that's a very purely first person film, right? Yeah. She's shooting it, she's recording the sound, she's running around, you know, China being chased by the police and it's very much in there. So in that film, I'd say something that I, you know, thought a lot about sort of applying there um, was the idea of point of view and perspective, right? Um, and something that I sort of come back to time and again with sort of figuring out what's right musically for any film is like the point of view, the emotional point of view of the protagonist. And if the music is authentic to that feeling, right? And that that just having that in some part of the mind, even if I don't know consciously how I'm going to translate that musically, sort of putting that into the back of the mind and then sort of composing with that and letting that sort of animate and guide their sort of creation of, mu of the music is always something that's that's really essential, right? Um, and, you know, so her, her earlier films were more sort of purely first person um, okay. in this way. Now, you know, and she narrates them. Now in the same breath, an interesting sort of thing about it is she does narrate it. There is a strong first person element. It is very much her um, unique point of view, both in terms of her voiceover, the presentation, and her sort of editorial um, techniques, which again are a very sort of autorist thing that's very specific to the way that she works with a very disparate kind of material, right, and a particular relationship to memory and flashback. But um, one thing that was a little bit different here um, was that um, this was not she was not running around shooting the whole thing herself, right? This was the pandemic and half of the stuff, you know, the, the film deals with, um, the film deals with um, disturbing um, uh, sort of similarities and reflections in the um, response to COVID-19 from the Chinese and American authorities. Yes. Um, not, and it's not to say that there are 100% direct parallels, but there are disturbing types of parallels that are, that are very interesting to look at. Um, mm -hmm. And so, she has in this um, some amazing footage that remote camera people that she got in touch with, you know, discreetly in China were shooting, you know, in Wuhan and in China. Um, and, um, and they, you know, really put themselves at great risk and, and brought back, you know, really tremendous and very powerful um, and very enlightening um, footage. Um, but I, I think, you know, one thing that, that winds up happening is that, you know, 
it, it gives, um, because there's a bit more of a distance, right, in terms of the way that we look at some of the images, you know, we're seeing these larger, say, cityscapes of New York City and of, and of Wuhan, and there's, there's, there's more of a sense of remove, right, than just purely being in her subjectivity as a character. Um, so in some ways that also opened up different things to explore in terms of what the music would feel like. And I would say overall, um, there are some, uh, the music is able to express a sort of grander sense of um, dystopia and apocalypse um, right. than, than would have maybe been appropriate to, to, to be quite as expressive about in something that was, that was a more intimate, you know, uh, or I mean, there's there's a lot of intimacy in this film as well, but you know, just a purely sort of first person kind of thing, um, and that also speaks to I think, um, you know, we talk about the sort of point of view and subjectivity, and that's kind of one of the things that to me is very important, right? In the subtext of the scenes, um, in creating a score, you know, both for a, a narrative or or a doc. But I think similarly, the other thing that I think about a lot is, um, and this is a more nebulous and sort of kind of harder to pin down thing. It's a bit more touchy-feely, which which I think the score is crucial for, which is just what is what does this world feel like? What is the nature of this film? What is the overall affect of this piece? And how are, you know, how are we as the audience meant to um, kind of take this overall reality that we're stepping into? What is the aesthetic of the piece? Um, you know, and so here, you know, for this film, I think there was um, you know, there, there's a strong element of, of uh, expression of, of tragedy as we've been talking about. And um, certainly the use of strings and solo strings were, were an important part of that. Um, but that's set against sometimes in simultaneity um, with, um, with very apocalyptic, dystopian, almost, almost Blade Runner inspired, you know, um, monolithic, um, uh, synth blocks and things like that and and very sort of defamiliarized sounds which all kind of um, go together in interesting ways um, so yeah that was it was a very interesting experience but I think again you know the the last film that I had uh, with Nan Fu at Sundance um, One Child Nation and I should say both that one and Hooligan Sparrow I did those films um, with my friend uh, Chris Ruggiero who co-composed uh, those films um, and in the case of those you know when you're dealing with footage of um, you know, forced abortions and sterilizations and, you know, fields full of fetuses, you know, as we were discussing earlier, you need to tread very lightly around that. In a lot of cases, there's not much to add musically, right? Like if you start piling on additional sort of tragedy musically, that's going to irritate the audience and it's going to take you out of it. So, um, you know, I think it's it's very important in, in those cases to know, you um, you know, what subtext are you bringing or not? Like if the, you, in other words, ideally, musically, you need to be dialing into and dialing up a subtext that's authentic to the material, but which we as the audience might not fully get otherwise. So in some moments in, um, in, this, in the same breath, if we are seeing a blank and empty cityscape, what we're looking at doesn't necessarily have a horrible affect. It's just a cityscape. But we know that behind the windows and behind the doors is untold tragedy and death. Mm -hmm. And the music combined with these more neutral images can bring out sort of dialectically this sort of deeper truth. And that's the type of thing that I'm always very drawn to and very excited about in the score. Well, I think it's something too that you guys are all very, very um, adept at and you are such powerful storytellers in your space. and. I just I have to thank you all for spending the time with us to, to tell you about tell us about your journeys and, and also about these really, really special projects. Um, I, the last question that I have for you guys is what are you looking forward to this year at Sundance outside of this conversation, obviously? Um, and, and what advice would you give to people who, who might be watching and, and experiencing their their first Sundance? Um. I'm always excited just to see what those breakout movies are going to be. It's it's the thing that we all want to know. What's going to be the beasts of the Southern Wild of this year? Um, and I guess I would add just it's such a wonderful, safe community to to experiment in. And and it, Sundance has done a lot for me over the years. And I I think if you can uh, if you're lucky enough to have a project 
here, then just make the most of it and make those connections and, and cling on to it for dear life because there's really nothing quite like it. I'm looking forward to a couple of films um, which have been scored by friends of mine. So uh, I can't wait to see them. One is Censor, <clears throat> which is a, a horror, a UK horror um, uh, by Prano Bailey Bond. And, um, and another one is Misha and the Wolves, which is just such like an intriguing story. Um, uh, so I'm, so I think director is Sam Hopkinson. So uh, scored by a friend of mine, Nick Foster. So I can't wait to see those films. And I think you know, last year Sundance was my, I had my very first Sundance last okay. year, and uh, just before COVID hit. Uh, so I, I consider myself to be incredibly privileged to have been able to attend, and it was just a blast i i just had just the most incredible time it's it's the most beautiful of settings of any film festival i've ever been to and um and and music has such a special warm place in, the, in at the heart of the festival um and and the connections you make will last a long time so you know i just think make the most network like hell and and just you know make new friends uh, as as well as uh, meet new collaborators that's right i um i always look forward to seeing the um the, um, the uh short film yeah. um that's always a very special part of uh of sundance for me and something i always really look forward to um and um and i'll that's definitely something i'll be um looking for uh this year um, and I mean, another thing that's, we're doing it virtually now, but one of the things that's always really uh, has been special to me with Sundance over the years is meeting um, other composers. Um, and I just, we're doing this virtually this time, but I've, you know, you, you all I've, I've never met before and, and, you know, and I love your work and it's, it's so nice getting to meet you. And I think that, you know, for me, usually, you know, we spend our, our, most of our time as composers with either our musicians that we work with or with our directors and editors and stuff like that. But because we're all, you know, huddled away in our studios, you know, uh, you know, we don't always see each other quite, uh, quite as much. So that's, that's always a really nice uh, for me and real special thing at, uh, at some Yes, I, I too am glad that we got to gather this year. And thank you again for joining us at the Film Music House and happy sun dancing. <laughs>